If you are a baby boomer boy, and yes, even a few girls, then you probably built your share of plastic kit models. What you may not have appreciated was just how lucky you were to be a kid when you were. These kit models that we so painstakingly saved our allowances to buy were not even invented until shortly before World War II. Before that, model builders had kits made of solid wood that had been around well, almost as long as a steam locomotive itself. In fact, prior to the development of injection molded kits, most models were little more than a box with some shaped pieces of wood or a set of plans and some balsa sticks. All of them required extensive work to create decent results. Companies like Strombecker and Monogram in the United States and Tamiya in Japan had been selling these wooden models for years, but the future was coming at them headlong, and the future was plastics. It was in 1936 in the United Kingdom when a company called Frog started the plastic kit model business with a series of 172nd scale model kits they called Penguins. Of course, World War II and the need for all strategic materials to go to the war effort put the kibosh on plastic model manufacturing until after the war. But in the late 1940s, several American companies followed Frog's lead. The early ones in America were Hawk, Varney, Empire, Renwall, and Lindbergh. By the 1950s, many more manufacturers began plastic kit production, including the Japanese company Tamiya. Even Strombecker and Monogram saw that the plastic models began to surpass their wooden models in sales. They knew that they had to change. At first, companies like Strombecker and Monogram only molded the detailed parts in plastic. But as interest in the wooden models waned, they converted fully to injection molded plastic, an expensive technique to set up. By the 1960s, new companies like Aurora, Ravel, and AMT, along with established firms such as Monogram, were beginning to dominate the field in America. In the United Kingdom, the popular manufacturer was Airfix, while in France, it was Heller. Worldwide, new manufacturers began to join the field of injection molded plastic models. In the UK, there was Matchbox. In Italy, there was Italeri and ESCI. Even Russia got into the mix by starting a company called Novo. They did this by acquiring molds from Frog when Frog upgraded to new molds. But it was Japan that was the dragon waiting to be roused. Companies such as Fujimi, Nishimo, and Bandai were formed, and they upped the game. A matter of scale. Plastic kit models are called scale models because they are built to accurate miniature scales. For example, a 1 to 48 scale model, also called quarter scale, means that one inch on the model represents 48 inches on the real item. For a myriad of reasons, aircraft, ships, and land vehicles have evolved into their own and often incompatible scales. This was due to many reasons ranging from the size and cost of molds to the size of the average home display shelf to how much a kid was realistically expected to pay. Today, the most common scales are 172nd, 148, 135th, 132nd, and 125. Except for ships, which are on much smaller scales since obviously ships are much bigger. Companies have tried to introduce new scales, but rarely with any success. For example, in the 1960s, the Tamiya Corporation manufactured a series of 1 to 100 scale aircraft kits. These were popular aircraft, but the 1 to 100 scale kits never really enjoyed the same success as the already established 1 to 70 second scale kits, so after a while the line was dropped. Since the 1970s, Japanese firms such as Hasegawa and Tamiya have continually raised the bar in accuracy and quality. In the 1990s, China entered the market and they entered in a big way. Chinese firms such as DML, AFV Club, and Trumpeter have redefined the standard for models by using the highest levels of technology to provide incredibly detailed kits. Brands from Russia, Central Europe, and Korea have also become prominent as well as many smaller companies, often by offering rather obscure choices. The downside is that a new kit can easily run over $100 but you do get a truly great kit. The cheap ones are still out there for the basic hobbyist, but now the hardcore builder has something to hold their interest. The main subjects. Plastic kits usually fall into one of five basic categories, military, civilian, science fiction, real space, and characters. 
Let's take a look at all five. Military kits are by far the best represented and break down into aviation, land, nautical, and characters. We have military aviation models which go all the way from the earliest biplanes to modern stealth bombers. In fact, this may be the single largest segment of the market. There is a kit, and usually more than one, for almost everything military that flies. The more popular the aircraft, the more options. Famous planes such as the P-51 Mustang and the Mitsubishi Zero are made by almost every company in scales ranging from tiny 1 to 350, which is usually made to put on model aircraft carriers, all the way up to 124th scale. Military land includes tanks, jeeps, trucks, motorcycles, and support vehicles, ranging from the World War I tank to the modern Humvee. Armored model scales get a little bit weird. They are often in the same scales as aircraft models, except for 1 to 35 scale. Many military land vehicles are made in 1 to 35 scale. In fact, it's probably the most common. But Monogram made some of its military vehicles and tanks in 1 to 32nd scale, but then made its Jeep, truck, and some other vehicles in 1 to 35 scale. So even within the same company, the scales don't necessarily match. The difference is really too small to notice, but it gives some idea of each manufacturer doing their own thing. Military nautical goes from sailing frigates to modern nuclear submarines, and they go from tiny to shelf filling in size. Ships are understandably usually 1 to 125th, down to 1 to 2,000 scale, given that a ship of any smaller scale would be enormous. For example, the popular 172nd scale model Gato submarine is almost four feet long. Military characters make up the last category, and they can be anything from one to 35 scale soldiers to fill out a diorama, up to one to six scale busts of a historical figure. Civilian. Civilian models are normally aviation and automotive. Civil aviation is mostly airliners, but there are some general aviation models ranging from light planes to corporate jets. I personally feel that this is a very underrepresented area, but the marketplace makes that call. Cars probably make up the biggest category of civilian models. The normal scale for a model car is 1 to 25 scale, but they range from 1 to 18 to 1 to 187 scale. One reason for 1 to 187 scale is that they become close to being compatible with HO scale model trains, which are actually 1 to 96 scale. Therefore, it's a way for a lot of hobbyists to get a wide selection of cars to put on their model railroad dioramas that or close enough in scale that no one really notices the difference. Model motorcycles make up a niche market and they are usually either 1 6th or 1 12th scale. The next big category is science fiction. The sci-fi category is dominated by only two franchises, Star Trek and Star Wars. These models tend to be disproportionately expensive, partly due to licensing fees. There are other franchises represented, such as both Battlestar Galactica series, Lost in Space, UFO, and The Invaders. There are even some vessels that are completely made up by the model companies themselves. It is a very popular genre. Real Space From Vostok to the Space Shuttle, this is a niche but well-represented market. Kits of early satellites and virtually every manned platform are available from the tiny 1 to 144 scale all the way up to the larger 1 to 12 scale kits. Characters. From King Kong and Godzilla to Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader, there are kits of many characters of both history, legend, and fantasy. This is a bit of a niche market also, but the old Aurora company specialized in them. Its follow-on company still makes many of them. Times change. By the 1980s, kids were moving on to other types of hobbies. And if I may take a second to sound like a grumpy old man, they were evolving into an instant gratification generation. Pre-made items, video games, and the internet were taking over. If you think I'm kidding, go to any hobby shop, which in itself is almost a thing of the past. And most guys looking at kit models are over 30. Oh, come on, let's be real. Over 40. This is not only because of waning interest over a time-consuming, concentration-intensive hobby, but also cost. 
A 148 scale monogram model P51 Mustang cost me $1.04 with tax in 1970. Today, I see the same kit for sale at hobby shops for around $20 and online for around $15. Based on inflation, it should not cost more than $7. Add paint, an air compressor, spray gun, etc., and it can easily get out of the reach of a kid. Never mind a guy with a family to feed. Given the number of companies making kits today, the hobby seems safe for a while. But between advancements in 3D printing and competing interests such as 3D graphics, home video production, the internet, all of which seek out our time and attention, kit modeling clearly faces some challenges in the future. But with nearly 8 billion people in the world, there seems to be a sufficient customer base, at least for the time being. So put on your latex gloves, break out that kit that's been collecting dust on the shelf, and get to building. I'm Max, and have a good build. Mm -hmm.